the Civil War was the most important event in American history. That's because it decided what kind of nation America would be and whether or not the promise of universal liberty would really be fulfilled. And what decided the outcome of the Civil War was its battles. Welcome to the Key Battles in the Civil War podcast. Welcome everyone to our series on the most important battles in the Civil War. We are coming near to the end of the series. Last time we looked at Sherman's March to the Sea, we saw the fall of Atlanta, where the South and its infrastructure and its industrial base and its entire ability to support the war is being destroyed. Sherman then swings up north. He goes through Savannah up to the Carolinas. But we left Grant. Where is Grant now? And is the war truly over? Lincoln has been reelected. But Grant now has to contend with his greatest foe, Robert E. Lee. We're going to see what happens with the Overland Campaign and the eventual end of the war. All right, we have a lot of territory to cover, much like the Union Army. So we're going to feel them in a sense as we march through quite a bit on our own right. So James, let's start up. What is Grant's plan for ending the war? A little bit of review might be in order. Yeah, let's back up to actually before the election and see what like you said, what Grant's plan is and what, what, at least on paper, what the Union is supposed to do. So Grant was brought over in March of 1864, and he was made a three-star general, as we mentioned, the only one in the Union Army. That's a lieutenant general, and he's only the second person to achieve a full rank of lieutenant general since George Washington. In other words, I don't know if I said that correctly, but George Washington had the rank, and now Grant's only the second person to have that rank. Right. And uh, he's also now general in chief of the entire Union Army. So he is in charge not just of the Eastern armies, but of everything. And we did touch on this, but let's review again. It doesn't hurt to go back over what uh, Grant is planning for the entire Union Army, East and West. He comes up with a five part strategy. First of all, he, he wants General Nathaniel Banks, who is out in Louisiana, commanding a relatively small force, not tiny, but much smaller than what Grant has and what Sherman has. Banks, his job is to march on Mobile. Mobile, Alabama was the last Confederate port on the Gulf of Mexico that was not, uh, had not been taken. He's supposed to take the city, then move eastward toward Georgia. And there were no significant Confederate forces in the area. So he probably wasn't going to have a whole lot of opposition. So that's part one. Part two is for Sherman. To as we to march toward take Atlanta, uh, he had Joseph Johnston in his way. But as we saw in a previous episode, uh, Johnston was fired and replaced by General Hood. And General Hood, is, as as an old TA of mine used to say, uh, Sherman didn't take Atlanta. Hood just lost it. <laughs> so uh, so Hood Hood was a disastrous choice to command uh, an army in the Confederacy or anywhere, I guess. But uh, we saw how Sherman did successfully take Atlanta and then march to the sea. So that part works. Um, Part C or part three, the Army of the Potomac is going to attack Lee's army, forcing him back toward Richmond and preventing him from reinforcing Joseph Johnston. Part four is that our old friend Benjamin Butler, (laughs) who he's like the Forrest Gump of the Civil War. He just pops up everywhere. There's several people like that we've seen. Johnston is another one, but... Butler now is in command of an army on the peninsula of Virginia, and and his job, it's called the Army of the James, uh, after the river, and his job is to march up towards Richmond from the southeast and put pressure on the city so that Lee would be attacked on two sides. And then another general named Franz Siegel, a German-American, he had an army of 6,500 in West Virginia. And I don't know if I ever mentioned this, but West Virginia breaks away from Virginia and becomes a separate state, officially gained statehood in 1863. Just interesting fun fact, it doesn't really affect the military situation that much, but um, but it's not, it's not part of the Confederacy. So, uh, Siegel's job is to march into the Shenandoah Valley, which we've talked about several times before, and we'll talk about it again. Very important uh, part of the Confederacy in, of Virginia. It's considered the breadbasket of Virginia. His job is to commandeer the resources there and disrupt communications with the Valley and Lee's army. And when Lincoln was asked, why are you putting these two generals, which everybody knew they weren't really great generals, why are you having them 
do this? Why, why, what's, what's the point of their actions? And Lincoln said, those not skinning can hold a leg. So, <laughs> so Grant is the one doing the skinning, and the uh, other two are going to hold the leg, which is Robert E. Lee's army. All right, so how did all that go? Well, first of all, Banks never even launched the attack on Mobile. Instead, he moved up the Red River in an attempt to invade Texas, and this effort fails, as do pretty much all efforts to invade Texas. Um, we did talk about this before, and this was not Banks' fault. It was actually Lincoln and General Halleck that told him to go take Texas instead of going to Mobile. But anyway, complete failure there. Uh, now here's we'll talk about Butler and Siegel. We didn't talk about talk. Uh, we did not talk about what happened to them. Butler moved extremely slowly up the Virginia Peninsula, just plodding along. Another great Union Army tradition. <laughs> <laughs> Butler moved so slowly that the Confederates were able to put together an army of eighteen thousand under Beauregard. That's another one of these Forrest Gump kind of people. He's just everywhere. He's we've seen him in the east, west, every north, south. Well, not north, but south. Anyway, so Beauregard's army defeats Butler at the Battle of Drury's Bluff, a fairly minor battle on May 15th, 1864. Butler entrenched, and Beauregard did likewise. And that's it. That's So basically, they're just going to sit there the rest of the time. Grant later said that Butler's army was as completely shut off from further operations directly against Richmond as if it had been a bottle strongly corked. <laughs> so... Good old Butler does what he does best. He blows it, and he's corked up pretty much. Uh, Beauregard is able to send reinforcements to Lee. And then in the valley, the Shenandoah Valley, Siegel was opposed by an army under John C. Breckinridge. Breckinridge has been in command for most of the war, uh, different armies, different places. Fun fact, he was the uh, vice president in the United States he, in hmm. <laughs> under Buchanan, yes, Breckinridge was vice president from 1857 to 1861, and uh, he had run for president. He was the Southern Democratic candidate in 1860, but of course lost and then threw in his lot with the Confederacy. Anyway, uh, the two forces clashed on May 15th at the Battle of Newmarket, which is a town in the Shenandoah Valley, and that was it for Siegel. He retreated northward, and he's out of the campaign too, so, <laughs> so nobody's going to hold a leg Grant's going to have to do the skinning without anybody helping him. All right. Well, here is where we see uh, Grant move south. And before we get into this, uh, I just want to mention uh, kind of as a meta comment that we're going to see Grant and Lee face off here. It's an interesting ch chess match. And of course, Grant has the advantage. But both of them are really formidable generals in their own right, of course. And we haven't seen that Many times in the Civil War, we have two competent generals facing off, where you have two clear strengths. And Grant's strength, he has complete and total adherence to the vision and his objective of neutralizing Lee's army, part his part of the five-point plan. Uh, and Lee's strengths is that he has his men are fiercely devoted to him, even after debacles like Gettysburg and other places. And he makes mistakes, of course. He misreads Grant. Sometimes he can place his small army in danger when he's too aggressive. But then at the same time, he can devise a creative solution to turn the tables on his more difficult situation. So both generals, they favor offensive operations. Both are willing to take risks. Um, both had handicaps. Lee, I would say, had many more. They both had subordinates that sometimes couldn't get the job done or execute the orders the way they wanted. So you can argue all day long about whether or not they're evenly matched, but there's no overwhelming superiority of tactical brilliance on one side or another. So anyway, shall we move south? Let's do it. Let's march south with General Grant and the Union Army. Okay, so with Grant in command, Grant, of course, had been a winner. He'd won pretty much every battle or campaign that he'd been in charge of out west, and uh the people of the North, of course, knew this, and their expectations were high. The Southern expectations were also high. You know, Gettysburg, even though, as you mentioned, it was a debacle for the Confederate Army, uh, people, the Southerners didn't really think after that, oh, man, woe is us, we're going to lose now. Far from it. They, they were still very confident. They had their hero, General Lee, in command, and uh, they really thought... Uh, again, they're on the defensive. They've got the advantage in that regard. Grant, they had repulsed, or Lee, and 
the Army of the Northern Virginia had repulsed attack after attack after attack. So there was no reason to think that this would be any different, even though you had Grant. Now, Grant had three objectives. First, his job was to tie Lee down, and he told General Meade, and I need to mention in passing here that General Meade, who was appointed to the command of the Army of the Potomac before Gettysburg, just a few days before, and he had been the, the Union commander at Gettysburg, victorious, Meade is still in command of the Army of the Potomac, so he's technically in charge, but of course Grant is the one that's really calling the shots. Meade, it's not an independent command for Meade. He, um, he, he does whatever Grant tells him because Grant makes his headquarters in the field to make communications much easier. So Grant tells Meade, wherever Lee goes, you will go also. And in addition to tying Lee down, he's going to bleed Lee's army as much as possible. And then the third, ar- third objective, and only third, this is, this is the least important of the three, and that is to take Richmond. General Grant agreed with President Lincoln that the army is the objective, not a city or, or anything else. You've got to take out Lee's army. If, as, no matter what cities you control, as long as you have this great big army under Lee's command running around, you're never safe. Now, Lee's goal, in fact, all he, this is all he could hope for, was to block Grant and to hold off as long as possible until the northern will to fight was exhausted. Lee's army was much smaller than Grant's, and it was operating on very low rations, but it had pretty high morale in spite of that. And as we mentioned before, back in our uh, episode on the election of 18, or when we talked about the election of 1864, we talked about how Lee and the entire Confederate leadership and everybody in the Confederacy was desperately hoping that a Democrat would win the uh, presidential election in the North in 1864 and would bring the war to an end. So they're just trying to hold out until the election just to not have any major disasters, major losses. At this point, we're, we're doing this topically. We looked at the West last time and now we're looking at the East. So we're back in time a little bit from where we left off after our episode in the March of the Sea, March to the Sea. So we're in the summer of 1864. Uh, Atlanta has not fallen yet. So again, the South thinks we've still got a pretty good chance. Now, when Grant comes down to face off against Lee, he's got about 120,000 men. And Lee only has about 60,000. So that's a two to one advantage. And Grant is going to milk that for all it's worth. Grant orders his army to march toward Lee. On May 4th, the Union Army crossed the Rapidan River, another one of those east-west rivers we talked about before. Grant is trying to flank, another one of these flanking movements that we've seen so many times. He's trying to get around the Confederate right flank. And again, let's, let's spell out the mental map. It's the same basic mental map that we've had in all of our battles that have occurred in Virginia. So the the two armies are spread out roughly east to west, not exactly, but they're more diagonal. But just think about Grant's army is at the top of the map. So so Grant's right, or the Union right, is actually the left side of our map. Um, And because he's coming south, he's upside down, if you will. But Lee's army, his right is the right of the map. It's the further to the east and Lee's left is further to the west on the left side of our map. So hopefully that uh, makes it pretty clear what's going on. Right. And here where uh, Grant's trying to get around the Confederate flank, and it's important for Lee to defend the river because Lee doesn't want to be forced, uh, especially back to Richmond, because if he is, then uh, the war in the east becomes a siege of Richmond, and sieges don't work well. Uh, we saw what happened at Vicksburg. We saw what happened if they're dug in. So if they have the freedom of mobility, then, as you mentioned, the strategy can work to drag this out longer. But if they're forced back, then things can fall apart quickly. Yeah, Lee is hoping to rely on the things that he's always relied on, surprise, using the terrain to his advantage, hopefully catching pieces of the Union Army separated from other pieces. That that had worked very well for him in the past. So hopefully, for Lee at least, that's what's going to happen. We'll see if it actually happens. Okay, so take us to the wilderness. All right, so the first, we're going to have a series of battles here. And the first is the Battle of the Wilderness. Grant's army camps at the old Chancellorsville battlefield. We talked about Chancellorsville. It seems like a million years ago, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> 1863. It was only one year ago in, in Civil War time. Um, 
This is the battle where it was Lee's masterpiece. It was the one where Lee had split his army twice and completely rattled Joe Hooker and defeated the Union Army, that, although Stonewall Jackson was killed in that battle. So they're back on that same battlefield. Torrential rains had washed open many of the shallow graves from that battle, and they, there were many skeletons exposed. So it really was, for the soldiers, it must have been pretty ghoulish, you know, pretty creepy to go down there and you're seeing all these skeletons and you're thinking, gee, that might be me in a day or two. Um, fighting breaks out on May 5th between parts of the two armies on the Confederate right. And by this time, the armies have turned a little bit. We talked about how Grant's trying to get around Lee's right. So the Confederate right is actually the north now. Uh, they're laid out kind of, uh, well, how should I say this? They're kind of like northeast to southwest. And the wilderness is very, very thick. It, at the time, it was uh, there's a lot of scrub brush, undergrowth. And, and I've been there, and it really is a wilderness. It still is today. Control of the armies is very difficult. Smoke filled the battlefield, which was already filled with trees of all sizes, and there were several incidents of friendly fire. Uh, even, even this late in the war, people are accidentally shooting their own soldiers, their own uh, you know, comrades, if you will. Fighting breaks out on the Confederate left, which is the south, and each side gives some ground. Each side lost some people by the end of the day, and fighting had stopped by the evening. On the morning of the 6th, the next day, Winfield Scott Hancock, his corps, smashed the part of the Confederate line that he faced. And Lee is obviously very stressed about this, and he wants to see what's happening. He rides out to the front to personally rally the troops. This is something he didn't usually do. And a group of Texas soldiers grabbed Lee's reins and ordered him to the rear. <laughs> it's really kind of funny. You know, he's the commander, and yet he's being ordered by privates and other lower people. They literally force him to stop, and they say, we will not go any further until you go back to the rear. They did not want him to be killed like so many other generals were killed. Now, just as the Confederate line is about to collapse, and we, how many times have we seen this, Scott? It's just, oh, they're so close, and then, dun da 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 here comes Rohan the Rohan rides in. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, this is not cavalry. It's actually infantry. But again, Longstreet arrives. Uh, they had been out looking for food, but Longstreet's corps marches in. And once again, Longstreet saves the day. They stabilize the line and they even push the Federals back. So fighting stops again in the evening. Now, because of all the artillery shells, a lot of fires had been set. And several, it was just awful because there were wounded soldiers that were caught in the area of the fires and they were unable to get away and they just burned to death. Can you imagine the horror of that? Let's say you're wounded in the leg and you can't, you can't walk, you can't move, you can't even hardly crawl. And then here comes this fire. You, it's awful to think of. So in this battle, the fe Federals suffered about 75, what am I saying? I'm sorry, 17,500 casualties. Lee lost about 12,000, which is exact, almost the exact same number as he had lost a year before at Chancellorsville. And this is about a sixth of each army. It was the third bloodiest battle of the war in terms of total casualties. So really bloody battle. Uh, and again, look at those numbers. The Union loses almost 18,000. The Confederates lose 12,000. So the Union actually loses more people. But uh, the Confederacy can ill afford to lose 12,000. James Longstreet, ironically, was actually shot by some of his own troops. Almost, it's almost like deja vu. It's like a replay of Stonewall Jackson being shot by his own troops a year earlier. But the difference is, is that Longstreet does not die. Longstreet is not killed, but he is out for several months. So Lee loses his best corps commander, at least for a while. Now, the battle, who won the battle? The battle was a slight, let's say a slight tactical victory for Lee, but Grant refused to retreat. That's the difference between Grant and everybody who had come before him, not counting Meade, of course. But if you think about McClellan, McDowell, General Pope, uh, General Burnside, General Hooker, what these generals had all done was they went down, they attacked Lee. They lost, and then they retreated, and they left. Grant doesn't retreat. Instead, he just keeps right on going. He tries to move around Lee's right one more time towards a, a place called Spotsylvania Courthouse. And the Union soldiers cheered when they realized they were moving toward Richmond and not retreating. 
they literally reached this fork in the road or a turning point, of, we would say an intersection, where if they had turned left, they would have been going back toward Washington, but they didn't. They turned right. And a great cheer breaks out. Can you imagine? They, they, were, they were just so excited to have a commander that's going to continue to fight, that's not going to give up after one loss. All right, so Lee moves as well to keep his army in between Grant and Richmond. Parts of his army reached Spotsylvania Courthouse first. Some were literally running to beat the Federals there, and they started entrenching. And this is something that the Confederacy doesn't really know what's going on at first, because from first Grant's perspective, what he wants to do is place the Federals between Lee and Richmond and force Lee to leave the wilderness so that Grant can fight him on his own ground, the ground of his own choosing. Uh, Before it's clear that they're moving to Spotsylvania, Lee's confused about what Grant's next move is. Maybe they want to keep hammering them in the wilderness. Maybe they want to sidestep to Fredericksburg, uh, press south along Richmond. Maybe they're preparing to march to Spotsylvania Courthouse. So it's not very clear at the beginning, but... That's why they had to run. They real uh oh, he's going to Spotsylvania. We can't let him get there, so they had to run. And yeah, you, Lee wasn't used to facing somebody who keeps on coming. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't doesn't quit and go home. I mean, Lee knew that Grant was a good general and that he was aggressive, but wasn't quite prepared for this. He didn't have much experience with fighting competent opponents. <laughs> Hey everyone, Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. The History of North America podcast is a sweeping historical saga of the United States, Canada, and Mexico from their deep origins to our present epoch. Join me, Mark Vinette, on this exciting, fascinating, epic journey through time, focusing on the compelling, wonderful, and tragic stories of North America's inhabitants. Heroes, villains, leaders, environment, and geography. I invite you to come along for the ride. Once in a generation, a podcast comes along with the power and eloquence to inspire us all. This show will entertain you while you wait for that one. Join two best friends, author and former history teacher John Driver and comedian Johnny W. for hilarious and authentic conversations about life, History, culture, faith, and everything in between. You can listen to Talk About That wherever you find your podcasts or at lifeaudio.com. Are you concerned about tensions in the Middle East? Do you wonder where we're currently at in the biblical timeline? Are we really in the last days? Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Carl Muller with the Inside the Epicenter podcast. Every week, my co-host, best-selling author Joel Rosenberg, and I answer those questions and more. You'll hear inside knowledge of our meetings with leaders at the highest levels of government in the U.S., Israel, and the Middle East, equipping you to filter the news with biblically sound insights. Find Inside the Epicenter on your favorite podcast app or go to joshuafund.com to listen and subscribe. All right, shall we go on to Spotsylvania? Let's. All right, and this is May 8th, so it's just uh, you know just a few days after the wilderness started, and it's almost continuous fighting. On May 8th, parts of the two armies collided without much effect, and that evening the two armies begin to entrench. And we've seen this before. We were talking about this in the West, around Atlanta in a previous episode. This has become standard procedure. Both sides, before they do any kind of fighting, they build trenches. We're moving in the direction of World War I style warfare, not there yet. These are not the elaborate networks of trenches that you see in in World War I, but it's a beginning. The two sides, they realize that if the other side attacks, they need to be ready and they need to be dug in with a good defensive position. So the next morning, one of the Corps commanders in the Union Army, this is just kind of an interesting story, ironic, one of the many ironies of the Civil War, General John Sedgwick, this was a very popular general. His troops loved him. They called him Uncle John. He was inspecting his corps' line. Some of his officers warned him to be careful. And he said, oh, boys, they couldn't hit an elephant at this distance. (laughs) And immediately after this, he was shot through the head by a Confederate sharpshooter's bullet, and he died instantly. That's a factoid that is just spread throughout the middle schools and high schools of this great land. Uh, 
you could forget every detail from the Civil War, but that there has lived on, that fact. Yeah, it, I mean, it's a, I don't want to say it's a great story. It's terrible. It's sad, <laughs> but uh, just kind of a, a classic example of famous last words and, and mm-hmm. hubris. Um, yeah, they can oh. actually hit anything. So Uncle John is out, and I, he was the highest ranking Union general to be killed during the war. Okay. Now, the Confederate, I mean, I'm sorry, the Union Army, the Union commander, Lee, uh, Grant and Meade, they realized that Lee's line has a weakness. There's a big salient called the mule shoe, and a salient is basically a bulge. It's it's a like a little, <laughs> this is kind of gross, but the first thing that popped into my head was a pimple, you know, just sticking out. You know? Let's and pop those, that pimple and just spray the, the other line with what comes out. Yes, I have raised four teenagers. But, uh Anyway, so this this salient or this bulge it was called the mule shoe. It was sticking out toward the Federals. So on the tent, the Union soldiers broke a hole in the salient. They attacked it, and 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 they're starting to punch through. The next day, Union troops moved up, and the day after that, the twelfth, the twenty thousand troops under Hancock, General Winfield Scott Hancock, they overrun the mule shoe. So it's looking good for the Union for a while, but the Confederates regain control. And the worst close combat of the entire war took place. There was a lot of hand-to-hand fighting. We talked in a previous episode about how when you watch movies of the Civil War, it doesn't matter what the movie is, you're always going to see bayonets being stuck in people and, and, and people hitting them with the rifle butt and people even fist fighting. That didn't happen a whole lot in the Civil War, but here it did because they were so close together. One part of the salient became known as the Bloody Angle because so many people were killed there. And the firing at this battle was so intense that several trees, including a 22-inch oak, meaning 22 inches across, that's the uh, diameter, these trees were just cut down merely by musket and artillery fire. There's, in other words, so many bullets were fired, they literally cut down some trees. The fighting continued for the next several days, and on the 21st, Grant disengaged. He realized this is not really working the way I want it to, so we're going to pull out. The Federals lost another 18,000 casualties, so that's 36,000 so far, and the Confederates lost 13,000. So another incredibly bloody battle, and again, it's another draw. Neither side really accomplishes its objectives. Certainly the Union doesn't accomplish their objectives. Uh, Lee, I guess you could say Lee in a way does because he fights off another Union attack, but he loses so many people, it's really kind of a pyrrhic victory. Now, in the meantime, a fellow named Philip Sheridan, I can't remember if we've talked about Sheridan before. I think I have. Uh, he's one of these younger uh, Union officers coming up through the ranks. I think he started out as a captain at the beginning of the war, uh, maybe even lower rank. But now he's a general. He's in charge of cavalry. He leads a cavalry raid down all the way down to Richmond. There he encounters a rebel detachment under Jeb Stewart, good old Jeb, the chief of Confederate cavalry, Sheridan is quickly rising up to become the head of Union cavalry. So Sheridan and Stewart slug it out. They Their forces fight at the Battle of the Yellow Tavern on May 11th. And in this battle, Jeb Stewart is mortally wounded, and he dies the next day. So that is the end of Stewart. So another great Confederate commander is gone. Grant, after this, he writes Lincoln home. Uh, I'm sorry, he writes home to Lincoln, or it's not really home, he writes to Washington, but uh, he writes a letter to President Lincoln saying that I propose to fight it out on this line if it takes all summer. And there's a lot of other bad news that comes from the subsidiary armies of Grant at the same time. So for Grant himself, uh, Spotsylvania looks impregnable. But then on other fronts, other fronts, there's problems. You mentioned one. Um, Also, uh, Rebels under Breckinridge defeat Siegel at New Market. Uh, Mm -hmm. The Union offensive in the Shenandoah Valley doesn't work. Uh, I think Beauregard defeats Butler at uh, Drury's Bluff. So at the same time, all these problems are happening. So Grant figures, all right, it's up to me. It's up to my army to defeat Lee. So next step. That that really helped uh, build Union morale, at least somewhat, uh, this I'm going to fight it out if it takes all summer. That was the kind of fighting spirit that Lincoln had been so desperately looking for for years. Now he's finally got it. 
So, all right. All right. Next step, yeah. North Anna. All right, we're going to do it again. By late May, Grant's and Lee's armies were exhausted. They had just been almost in continual combat for nearly a month. Uh, this is a new thing. I mean, we haven't really seen this before. We haven't seen this idea of the Union attacks. You have a big battle, then the Union attacks again, and they just keep hitting and hitting and hitting. That was one of Grant's philosophies of warfare was to hit hard and to hit often. <laughs> so that's exactly what he's doing. Since May 5th, there had been 24,000 Confederate and 36,000 Union casualties. That's just staggering. So that's 60,000 men total in just a month who had fallen, uh, either killed, wounded, or captured, or missing. Both sides are getting replacement soldiers, but the new soldiers were not of the same quality as the ones they replaced. Uh, the, especially the Union ones, are they're just kind of like, they're older, they're younger, some of them are um, like prisoners and things like that. They're just not not the same caliber. May 23rd, Grant tries again to move his army around Lee's right flank and to place his army between Lee and Richmond. So he keeps trying this. This time Lee anticipated the action and he placed his army behind the North Anna River. Lee's army was deployed in an inverted V. Grant deployed his army in a very awkward formation. Uh, so Lee had the interior lines, Grant had terrible lines. But interestingly enough, for the first time in the war, Lee becomes seriously ill and he has to be confined to his bed. Lee didn't have any subordinates whom he fully trusted, so he wasn't able to plan and, and order an attack on Grant. Who's he going to put in charge? There's really nobody. Longstreet is injured. Jeb Stewart is dead. So they don't do much. By the end of May, the two armies were positioned very close to the Seven Days Battlefield which we talked about a long time ago. That was McClellan versus Johnston and then Lee. Actually, that was, that was all Lee at that time. But the point is, is they're very, very close to Richmond. The Confederate line was six miles long and was anchored on both sides by rivers. Both armies dig in again. Scott, uh, let me pause just a second. Okay, okay. yeah, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll put the time code here to... Um, Sorry about that. One of the cats was yelling, and I was going to try to wait until it was your turn to talk again. But he was not, it wasn't. <laughs> he's not going to shut up. If you start on the point five, Lee became seriously ill, and then yeah. Okay. All right. Ready? Yeah. All right. So something interesting happens that. We haven't seen before. Lee actually becomes very ill and he's confined to his bed. He's unable to command. And he didn't really have any subordinates that he fully trusted. Longstreet had been wounded, as we saw. Longstreet is out of the picture. Jeb Stewart is dead. So he wasn't able to plan and order an attack on Grant. So the South pretty much does nothing for a while and a few to, until Lee's able to get up out of his bed and command again. By the end of May, the two armies were positioned very close to the Seven Days Battles and very close to Richmond. The Confederate line was about six miles long. And it was anchored on both sides by rivers, which is a very good defensive position. Both armies again dig in. So now Grant decides to launch another major assault at Cold Harbor. Cold Harbor was right in the middle of the old Seven Days Battlefield, and Grant wants to keep Lee's attention and keep him from sending troops to the valley or anywhere else. Grant was also frustrated by his inability thus far to crush Lee. He, was, he, thought, he thought it would be easier than this. He knew it wasn't going to be easy, but he didn't think it was going to be this hard, for crying out loud. And he feels that Lee's army is heavily weakened, which, which it is. But we'll see what happens. So he's planning this, ne this new attack and a lot of the soldiers, this is an interesting little factoid that I read about. Many of the Union soldiers knew that there was a good chance they might not survive this attack. A large number wrote their names and addresses on slips of paper and pinned them to their uniforms so that their bodies could be identified after the battle. You didn't have dog tags yet at this point in U.S. Army history. Which comes so about after the Civil War, interestingly enough. Yeah, the, the, you know, so they just have to go with little slips of paper. Uh, one soldier wrote in his diary, June 3rd, I was killed. 
And it turned out he was right. His diary was found on his body at the end of the day. So it's just, it's not looking good <laughs> if you're a Union soldier. Skirmishing occurs on June 1st and 2nd. Then on June 3rd, Grant orders 50,000 soldiers to attack 30,000 heavily entrenched Confederates. And this is another instance where we see a, a commander who knows better, nevertheless, ordering a frontal assault on an entrenched position. How many times have we seen this? We saw it at Pickett's Charge. We saw it at Fredericksburg. Now even Grant is doing it. And the attacks, of course, were easily repulsed. In three days, just three days, Grant lost 12,500 men to only 1,500 Confederates. Isn't that amazing? It's like a more than, well, it's not 10 to 1, but it's close, yeah. Getting close to that, yeah. It's like 8 or 9 to 1, I guess. Grant later admitted that he wished he had not ordered this attack. And this is the only thing that Grant ever admitted was a mistake. He, he said, you know, Cold Harbor should not have done that. And he shouldn't have. The Northern public became disenchanted with Grant. Many newspapers, especially Democratic ones, of course, called Grant the Butcher. So he gets another nickname, which is this time not an affectionate one. And of course, I have to say that these people that are calling him the Butcher, they completely disregarded what Grant had done in the West and the fact that he was wearing Lee down. They were just playing politics is what they were trying to do. And Lee realizes what Grant is doing. He wasn't fooled at all. He realizes that Grant is trying to bleed him to death, wear him down, and he's pushing him back toward Richmond. So so in a way, even though Grant is piling up these huge casualties and, and bodies right and left, he is actually doing exactly what he wanted to do. So it's just kind of interesting. Yeah, I have one question about this before we move on. Uh, you had mentioned that the charge fails, as it almost always does, because when you have a defensive position charging an enemy with long-range firepower, both sides continually do this. The result is almost always the same. Einstein's quote, insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. And again, these are highly intelligent men, some of the most capable minds of military strategy and history, you could argue. What do you think is the reason? Is it because there's simply no other alternative than to lead a charge on a defensive position, even though you know you'll have very high casualty rates because there's simply no other effort to no other way to dislodge an entrenched enemy and you have to do this to keep the war machine going? Is is that the reason or is it something else? I think that's certainly part of it, Scott. I think sometimes commanders just got frustrated. And just said, well, dadgum it, I'm just going to hit him with everything I have. Sherman had done this around Atlanta, we saw. I think, too, that Grant believed that Lee's army was so demoralized, so hungry, so lacking in supplies that they might actually, if they just hit it with everything they've got, which he didn't do, of course. He hit with 50,000. That wasn't everything he had. But, but if you could hit them hard enough, they would just collapse like a house of cards. Of course, that didn't happen. So, I mean, it's not completely insane. And, and we had seen back at uh, the Battle of Chattanooga where Grant was present, we saw a frontal assault that completely succeeded. The, the Confederates broke and ran. So who's to say this time it wouldn't happen either? But of course it didn't. And I'm also impressed at this point that the South has replacement troops because I don't know how high the draft is at this point for age 45, uh, somewhere around there. Uh, to the point where it's probably tricky to even bring in a harvest. So that they're still able to bring in replacement troops, I think is very impressive. Yes, and that so many of these men will keep on fighting even though they're sick and they're hungry and they're lacking shoes or other necessary supplies. It, it just boggles the mind. Now, a lot of people did desert, a lot of Confederate soldiers, but uh, most of them didn't. Hey, everyone, Scott here. One more brief word from our sponsors. The History of North America podcast is a sweeping historical saga of the United States, Canada, and Mexico, from their deep origins to our present epoch. Join me, Mark Vinette, on this exciting, fascinating, epic journey through time, focusing on the compelling, wonderful, and tragic stories of North America's inhabitants, heroes, villains, leaders, environment, and geography. I invite you to come along for the ride. 
Once in a Generation, a podcast comes along with the power and eloquence to inspire us all. This show will entertain you while you wait for that one. Join two best friends, author and former history teacher John Driver and comedian Johnny W. for hilarious and authentic conversations about life, history, culture, faith, and everything in between. You can listen to Talk About That wherever you find your podcasts or at lifeaudio.com. Hello, this is Dr. Doug Grotheis, host of Truth Tribe, where we seek the truth through reason and evidence about what matters most. And we are not tribal since truth is for everyone. Please join me at the Truth Tribe as I discuss the reasons for Christian faith, the Christian worldview, and moral issues such as abortion and gender ideology. To listen now, go to lifeaudio.com or search Truth Tribe on your favorite podcast app. After Cold Harbor, which is again a complete Union disaster, Grant disengaged, and he moved the army across the James River in a wide turning movement. The Union Army made an immense pontoon bridge, the biggest one in the entire war, and Petersburg is his aim. And now the the armies are pretty much north to south. They're laid out north to south, and Petersburg is south of Richmond, and Grant's going to try to take it. Lee is again surprised, but despite this, the Union Corps commander in charge of taking Petersburg failed to push into the city. This is June 15th through 18th. So again, we're still only six weeks after Grant had begun the campaign. Lee rushed troops down to Petersburg, and by the 18th, the Federals, uh, by the 18th, they had secured the city. The Federals lost 11,000 during these few days, and the Confederates lost only about 5,500. So again, We see this over and over and over during this campaign. The Union Army takes staggering losses, way more than the Confederacy, but they have more to lose. It's a strategy of attrition. Lee's army constructs an intricate set of trenches protecting the city of Petersburg, and morale among the federal troops begins to decline. One regiment actually refused to attack the trenches when ordered to do so. So we're starting to see mutinies breaking out here. When a newer regiment started to attack, the veterans yelled, lie down, you damn fools, you can't take them works. They attacked anyway, and they lost 75% of their men. So let's sum up this campaign. Since May 5th, Grant had averaged more than 2,000 casualties per day. 2,000 a day. Can you just imagine that? That's just mind boggling. In in two days, that's the entire 2003 Iraq war, I think. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's more than Pearl Harbor. It's more than 9-11. Uh, so, but that's 2,000 per day over more than 30 days. So that's 60,000 total. Lee averaged only, about, I say only in quotes, 1,000 per day, which is 30,000 total. And this is basically a first Manassas or first bull run every day. Which then it, was one of the most deadly conflicts for decades in America. Yeah, at the time, at the time, people thought, after, at Bull Run, they thought, oh, this is awful. This is the worst thing we've ever seen. And it was. It was the worst battle uh, up to that time. But now it's like that's every day. That's just one. Yeah, it's amazing to think of how many. It, there's no wonder that the Union was really starting to lose heart. And this, and that Lincoln was starting to think, I'm really going to lose this election. In addition to all this, many Union soldiers' terms of enlistment had run out. And they went home. They they had signed up for three years. and. So we're done. Goodbye. Uh, opposition to Lincoln's reelection rises to an all time high at this point. So this is the low water mark of the Union, at least for 1864. All right. Well, it's good to bring this in because if you only look at one aspect of this, like Sherman's March to the Sea, that it's a triumphant swelling ride upward. And that is not the case. There are setbacks at this point up until the very end of the war. Uh, So what we're going to do now is uh, in the next episode, we're going to finish the Overland campaign, but we're also going to do an excursus on something very important in this war, and that is African Americans in uniform. How do they benefit the Union side? Because in one sense, this is the entire reason the war is being fought for, but it's not just about ending slavery. It's the beginning of uh, the question among Americans in the mid-19th century is To what level of equality should African-Americans be given? 
Should they simply not be enslaved but have something of a second-class status? And this is something that, keep in mind in America, it's not just an issue for African Americans, but women don't have the right to vote. And equality across the spectrum isn't something that is legally entrenched at this point. Should they have a second-class status but not be enslaved? Should they have full legal equality? Does that also include enlistment responsibilities as well? And this isn't just a question that happens on the Union side. Oddly enough, this is also a question that happens on the Confederate side as well. So anything else you want to mention about this before we wrap up, James? No, I think we summed it up pretty well. I just I will say that just a reminder that at, when we left off here at the end of the Battle of, well, Petersburg, it wasn't, we did Cold Harbor and then we did the attempt to take Petersburg, which failed. At this point, the march to the sea and the, the fall of Atlanta had not happened. So it was pretty much all bad news for the North at this okay. point. So this is the dark night of the soul of the Union. Yeah, we'll it see. is. <laughs> so we'll see how they emerge in the next episode. Thanks for listening to the Key Battles in the Civil War podcast. Be sure to subscribe to the show in the podcast player of your choice and leave us a rating and a review. This helps us grow and reach new listeners. You can also find maps of the battle sites, show notes each episode, and plenty of other history info by going to keybattlesinthecivilwar.com. Thanks for listening, and see you next time. Keep